So uh, I'm Afzal Sheikh. Many of you already know me. Uh, one of the ultrasound fellows is here. Uh, so my topic this uh, on this day is about lung ultrasound. So I'm just going to start. Um, the clinical indications for performing lung ultrasound are, um, um, you know, to evaluate acute shortness of breath, whether in the ICU or the ER. Uh, it can also be used to um, see if the uh, endotracheal tube is in the in the trachea, uh, um, and uh, of course, uh, common causes of shortness of breath like pneumothorax or alveolar interstitial syndrome, consolidations, and pleural effusions, they can all be diagnosed and characterized on ultrasound. So there are uh, many scanning techniques. The one that we are uh, we frequently use is based on um, something called the Blue Protocol, which was published by Dr. Daniel Lichtenstein. Uh, and it's uh, based on the idea that uh, air rises and uh, fluid uh, and dense tissue like consolidations are going to be in the more dependent parts of, of the lung. So if you, um, you know, this is uh, an, an example of how he suggests we do it. If you place two hands on the anterior chest, uh, the, in the, uh, fifth digit will be bordering the inferior uh, clavic uh, clavicle on the upper hand and the fifth digit on the lower hand will be along the, uh, the, or the phrenic line. So about the location of the diaphragm. The wrists uh, define roughly the anterior axillary line. And then um, he suggests to um, place, uh, you know, a, um, so called the upper blue point, like between the uh, index, between the ring finger and the small finger. And the second point would be uh, in the middle of the, uh, of the palm over here in the dorsum side. Uh, third point, so this is the anterior chest. So looking at two points on the anterior chest, um, a line can be drawn from here and where it meets the mid axillary line would be a third point on the lateral chest. A fourth point is defined as the PLAPS point, which stands for posterior lateral alveolar, alveolar pleural syndrome. And the idea here is that pleural fluid and dependent consolidations would be maximally identified at that location because they're dependent. So in order to get this point, you have to really get underneath the, uh, uh, where the edge of the bed and the bed and the edge of the patient is like uh, in that location. And even if possible, move the patient a few centimeters um, uh, uh, to the other side. Now, another maneuver that he suggested was something called lateralization maneuver, which is basically moving the patient a little bit more so you could get your probe underneath and then you can uh, image small uh, pleural effusions uh, that way. So this is, uh, uh, so there are other techniques as well that we use. Uh, they're like the eight zone, 12 zone, as you can imagine, these will require more time, but they're more comprehensive. Um, many of us use Focus 101, so I will refer to that as well. Uh, on Focus 101, a similar, uh, basically it's sort of adapted from the um, uh, Blue pro Protocol, where we use R1, R2, and R3. And R1 is at the upper blue point along the uh, sternum. R2 is where the mid axilla and the phrenic line meet, and R3 is the flaps point. So this is the locations on the chest that we should be scanning. Uh, and I want to make the point that when you place the probe on the chest, the probe should be perpendicular to the chest wall, because all the images that we gain uh, are essentially artifacts, but, and they, they, they have to, um, they, you know, the artifacts are generated when the ultrasound beam hits a reflective surface, and then it returns to the probe. So the echoes will be maximized if your angle is 90 degrees. So you can see here at a 90 degree angle, you can see a very sharp border of the plural line. If you at a 60 degree angle, you see a more hazy, uh, hazy line. So uh, at any point on the chest wall, your probe should be uh, as perpendicular as possible to, uh, to the chest wall. Um, so that you can um, get a clear image. 
I got one second. Sorry. Sorry. <clears throat> All the images that we get on um, lung ultrasound are uh, based on the ratio of air and fluid. So as an example, if you have a pneumothorax, there's air between the visceral and parietal pleura. Air is, uh, offers a high acoustic impedance to ultrasound waves, so they don't transmit through that. Um, so ultrasound waves come to it, and then they meet the parietal pleura, and they kind of bounce back and forth, generating an um, A-line as they come at a greater uh, as more time elapses between the first and the second and third, fourth, the A lines are uh, put on the screen at greater depths. Um, in the because the visceral and parietal pleura are not touching, there is no uh, lung sliding. Normal lung surface, same thing happens, but then you get lung sliding, and then you can see the shimmering artifact. When you get something like interstitial syndrome, I'll talk about these in more detail, obviously later on. There's thickening of the interlobular septa, either by permeability-induced uh, pulmonary edema or hemodynamic pulmonary edema. And then air can, uh, sorry, ultrasound waves can transmit through them, create a, um, a beeline pattern. When you get consolidation, now it's full of fluid. The density, there's more, more, there's more fluid and, there's, uh, and the ultrasound beams can actually transmit through them much more uh, easily. And you can see a consolidation pattern. If you have a pleural effusion, obviously you can see an anechoic space. So, um, so uh, the, it's important to keep in mind that um, unless the lung is consolidated, we're dealing with a lot of artifacts that are generated from the ratio of air and fluid in them. So first uh, I'll talk about something, you know, I'll talk about pleural line and lung sliding. So, um, so the, the, to identify this, the first thing would be to um, look at the, find the rib shadow. So it's important to get the rib shadow, uh, to get your landmarks right, um, because some people identify the pleural line by lung sliding, but uh, in pneumothoraces and other conditions as well, like lung sliding could be abolished or very diminished, and then um, you won't be able to identify it. So First, you look at the rib shadow. The rib shadow creates a uh, like a curved, a curved, a pro, a curved um, echo, and then deep to that, this is the periosteum of the rib. So deep to that, the rib shadow, about 0.5 centimeters deep to the rib shadow, a pleural line is visible, and then this is the represents the uh, opposition of uh, visceral and parietal pleura. And as the patient breathes, you will see like a shimmering artifact that goes back and forth. Um, normal, if you have normal lung sliding and A-line pattern, which is seen here, uh, then it, that is considered a normal lung. And just as a, as a, a brief reminder, the uh, A-lines are generated by the ultrasound beam going from the probe to the pleura and sort of doing this bouncing back and forth movement. And at each successive turn, uh, the uh, probe thinks the uh, depth is greater. So the A lines are put at equidistant depths deep to the original plural line. Oops. Oh, all right. So as I said, lung sliding represents the apposition of parietal and visceral pleura. And lung sliding can be absent if anything comes between the visceral and parietal pleura, like air or fluid. But just keep in mind that um, it can also be absent or very minimized in the setting of, say, situations in which the patient is not breathing. Like, for example, if somebody is apneic or extremely hyperinflated and the actual movement of the visceral and parietal pleura is very minimal, or if the if it's esophageally intubated, or in disease states like you know, ARDS or interstitial fibrosis, or pleural adhesions that actually uh, injure the the pleural surface and and prevent like smooth sliding of the pleura. So in those circumstances situations, lung sliding is also um, affected. Uh, the next point that I want to talk about is lung pulsations. So lung pulsations are um, they don't, they represent the, the transmitted movement of uh, cardiac ejection uh, to the pleura. So 
this is sort of this this can be used in the setting when if somebody's apneic and you want to know and there's no lung slidings and you want to know if the pleura are actually opposed, then you can look for lung pulsations. So um, M mode can be used to detect lung sliding. Um, so M mode uh, is motion, is detects motion along, um, along a single line. So in this case, like uh, motion is tracked from the probe all the way down to the bottom of the screen. And this on the x-axis is time. So it's very, um, it's very, uh, can detect very precisely very small, um, uh, small amounts of, of, of movement. So this is a normal M mode profile of a lung. Chest wall is not moving. This is the plural line relative to the chest wall, lung is moving. And then you get this appearance that looks like a seashore. And if you can imagine, um, this part to be like, um, well, some people, you know, so this part can represent like uh, the, the waves of the ocean, uh, you know, the, the waves in the ocean, and then this part represents the beach. So it's called like a seashore sign, and um, it's a completely normal M mode uh, profile of, uh, of, of lung. If, if there's a, um, if there's air between the uh, visceral and parietal pleura, <clears throat> now, there's no, the movement is abolished. So you get what's called the barcode sign. And this pattern continues because movement is a, uh, below the, um, the, uh, the lung line, the, the visceral pleura is, is uh, not there. And so a very different profile is, uh, is achieved. So um, the reason for discussing all these things was to talk about a pneumothorax uh, pneumothorax can be diagnosed with um, an ultrasound, but let me just see, I don't know if this, okay. Um, but it's easier to rule it out. If lung sliding is present, okay, then we know that um, the visceral and parietal pleura are next to each other, the, the, you know, uh, um, and, and, they're, and they're sliding and there's no air between them. So you can rule out a pneumothorax. B lines originate from the pleural line, and they, all can, they can also rule out a pneumothorax. If the patient's apneic uh, and uh, you cannot detect uh, the shimmering artifact at the pleural line, if you see a lung pulse, which is the, the repetitive cardiac movements that are uh, transmitted to the pleural line, um, they're, in they're in synchrony with the pulse. If you see that, then you know the visceral and parietal pleura are next to each other and they're opposed, there's nothing between them and you can rule out a pneumothorax. Ruling in a pneumothorax, okay, that requires a lung point. Okay, a lung point is 100% specific for a pneumothorax, uh, but it's hard to find. So I'll talk about that in the next slide. So I wanted to uh, quote this from Dr. Lichtenstein's uh, book uh, that ultrasound is quite accurate in the ICU at detecting pneumothorax. Uh, in my personal experience, it's easy to rule it out because you see uh, lung sliding, B lines or lung pulse, you know, it's not there. Finding a lung point can be hard if the pneumothorax is, uh, you know, depending on where it is on the chest. So the M mode can be used to detect um, <clears throat> lung sliding as well. <clears throat> the lung slide, what is, uh, sorry, a lung point as well. So lung point, if, if you look at the CT uh, of the chest, lung point is this location right here. So if somebody um, takes a deep, if, if this patient is breathing, they'll be uh, at this point, the lung will expand. And uh, at this junction, the visceral and parietal pleura will actually meet. Okay. And when, it, when they do, when they meet, then you will see this pattern of a seashore sign. And when they um, exhale, then the lung will return back to its original position and then air will uh, seep between those areas at the lung point and you'll see a barcode sign. So um, seeing this in real time, where if you look at the plural line and then you see shimmering over here and then it stops and then it moves back and a portion of the lung, uh, the plural line is like still and a portion of it is like actually moving with shimmering artifact that's lung point. You can actually pick that up on M mode because 
if you put the M mode through it. And so once you pick this up, uh, if your technique is correct, this is 100% specific for pneumothorax, depending on where it is, you may have to move the probe. The um, M mode is very, very um, sensitive at picking up movement. So if you make even small movements with your probe while you're in M mode, you will be able to mimic uh, a fake lung point. If you can look here, this is a plural line, okay? And then it looks like the patient is going into, this is the seashore sign right here and back and the barcode seashore and then back to barcode. But this is actually created by movements of the, of the probe. And the way you know that is because you can see this above the plural line too. So the idea, the point is keep the, um, the probe absolutely still when you're recording in M mode. All right, moving on to the next uh, topic, interstitial syndrome and alveolar consolidation. So in order to understand what interstitial syndrome is, we, we have to get, you have, we have to talk a little bit about the basic, uh, an, uh, basic unit of, of, of lung. Uh, this is like the, called the secondary pulmonary lo um, uh, uh, lobule, but it's basically, uh, it's like a terminal unit um, with um, several pulmonary acini, and it's had the terminal arterial, terminal bronchial, and it's the smallest unit that's completely surrounded by connective tissue. So this would be in this connective tissue are uh, lymphatics and pulmonary veins, and um, um, and and these are about one or two centimeters in uh, in diameter. So. Um, on a CAT scan, if you look at this CAT scan here, uh, this patient has ground glass changes centrally <clears throat> and pleural effusion. And then these septa are thickened, which could be fluid or, or un inflammatory, ex inflammatory uh, uh, um, fluid as well. It could be hydrostatic fluid. But this idea of uh, interlobular septal thickening um, is what allows the ultrasound beams to uh, to create an, another artifact called a B-lines. So <clears throat> B-lines have a very specific definition and you have to um, follow their, uh, the criteria. So first let's talk about what they are, the cometal artifact. It comes from the plural line, it's hyperechoic. It extends from the plural line to the bottom of the screen without fading and erases A-lines and it moves with lung sliding. It's important to remember these things because they're mimics of B-lines, which I'll talk about shortly, uh, that can be confused with B-lines. So uh, this is to uh, get uh, orientation. This is the, this is the uh, rib shadow, rib shadow here, rib shadow is coming into view, a plural line 0.5 centimeters deep to the rib shadow. And a B line is visible from the plural line all the way to the bottom of the screen. It's a vertical hyperechoic cometal artifact. B lines, if there are three or more B lines in a longitudinal view between a rib space, that's called interstitial syndrome. Okay, less than three B lines are could be physiologic. Okay, and you can get rare B lines in dependent areas, especially um, in the last two intercostal spaces as well, and it's not considered interstitial syndrome. So, excuse me, next. So how are they generated? Well, it's not exactly, the theory is that basically even in the setting of like B lines or which represent interlobular septal thickening um, at the first level, um, the air is still the predominant um, material. So as the ultrasound beam comes um, uh, to between two alveoli, it sort of bounces between the two air-filled, um, um, several air-filled um, alveoli, there's reverberation. Some of those ultrasound beams return back to the probe and generate this profile. Um, and uh, that's sort of, that's what is thought to be uh, how they're, uh, they're produced. <clears throat> the rep clinically, what do they represent? They represent one of three things, either hemodynamic pulmonary edema or inflammatory pulmonary edema or chronic interstitial lung disease. The other thing that is important to keep in mind that they actually, um, 
they, um, as lung injury or lung water increases, the amount and density of B lines increase as well. So there's two, and that, you know, the same in cardiogenic pulmonary edema that what we think about is fast the lung water increases. The first thing that we see is water in the perivascular space. Then you get interlobular septal thickening, and then you get ground glass changes. Then you get finally alveolar consolidation. So it all depends on the gradations of, of uh, wedge pressure. Uh, similarly, B lines can be uh, tracked in that way. There's two different kinds of B lines described. There's the B7 and B3. B7 lines are roughly six to seven millimeters apart, and they represent interlobular septal thickening. B3 lines are supposed to represent ground glass changes. Ground glass is sort of that one level up above interlobular septal thickening when there's fluid actually entering the alveoli, but it's not full, it's not completely full of fluid, it's not fully consolidated. And we've seen many ground glass changes on CAT scan in the during COVID. So this would be an example of a B7 line. This would be an example of a B3 line. They're about three millimeters apart. Take a look at this. This is like confluent B lines. And you don't even see any separation between uh, individual B lines. This, so this would actually represent increased gradations of uh, or increased severity of pathology, whatever it is. It could be hemodynamic pulmonary edema or inflammatory pulmonary edema. B lines have mimics. So you, you need to follow these rules in order to identify them carefully. Like for example, this is a mimic, it's called a Z line. It looks like a vertical artifact, but it's not erasing the A line. So it cannot be a B line. And it also fades after a few centimeters into the screen. This is an E line. It's generated by subcutaneous emphysema. A little hyperechoic white line here can be confused by a B line, but they don't, they don't arise from the pleura, so that's out. The, and then they do not move with breathing. There are many other uh, mimics and artifacts that can be confused with B lines, but these are the important ones that I wanted to talk. So what do they represent? So um, B lines can be seen in interlobular septal thickening or ground glass changes. So that could be anything from cardiogenic pulmonary edema or non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema and interstitial fibrosis. There's an example, if you have focal B lines, you could be having pneumonia, atelectasis, contusion, infarction, neoplasia, or even just scarring after, say, radiation to the chest. If you have diffuse pulmonary edema, it would rep could represent cardiogenic pulmonary edema, volume overload, or ARDS, or interstitial pneumonitis. So your clinical context is going to de uh, decide or help you make a, a clinical diagnosis. Are there any ways to separate the two? Uh, there's some characteristic findings, like for example, if you have a cardiogenic pulmonary edema, um, the B lines are homogeneous and diffuse. So it would be more B lines in dependent parts of the lung, less so in the anterior, uh, anterior uh, part um, and uh, in a supine patient because um, of, uh, as you know, because uh, hydrostatic pulmonary edema settles and becomes uh, more dependent. Lung sliding is more apparent in heart failure induced edema, is reduced in non cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Possibly, if the pleura is involved in the inflammatory process, lung sliding can be abolished or even reduced. Non cardiogenic pulmonary edema, um, because it's sort of, you know, is patchy, its inflammation can be, it doesn't follow the same rules as hydrostatic pulmonary edema. You, it's non homogeneous, whereas B line distribution is homogeneous in um, heart failure induced edema. Palm, plural effusions are more likely in cardiogenic pulmonary edema, whereas less likely in non cardiogenic. Subplural consolidations, which uh, represent like, you know, an area of consolidation right below the pleura, they, they are absent in, uh, in heart failure induced edema and more likely in uh, non cardiogenic. So, so you could separate uh, the, the, the two uh, based on the B line pattern. So now talking about alveolar consolidation. So um, alveolar consolidations, um, as lung water increases, okay, it could be uh, inflammatory fluid or just hydrostatic 
edema. So uh, the, you can, the lung begins to, um, the alveoli fill up and now there's uh, predominantly like water uh, in it. So ultrasound beams can transmit through water very easily and they create a good image. So when you begin to see lung, you know that it's pathologic. So this is an example of like a, what's called a shred sign. <clears throat> so you see a hypoechoic area here. The pleura is uh, like a shred, shredded and it has this appearance of uh, basically uh, a li B lines here and then a consolidation underneath the pleura. So this is like a subpleural consolidation actually um, and looks like a called -called tissue like sign. This would be a more extensive consolidation where you see the diaphragm, okay, and then a consolidated lung. And you can see air bronchograms in it. Uh, excuse me. There are two types of air bronchograms uh, there's a static and, um, uh, and dynamic air bronchograms. So the idea between them is. Um, a static air bronchogram is basically air bubbles that are uh, trapped inside the, uh, the bronchi and they don't really move with respiration. Okay, so the appearance is the same throughout the uh, ex inhalation and exhalation. With dynamic air bronchograms, they actually move to the periphery with breathing. And so they're in communication with the air circuit. Um, actually, I had a, um, let's see if this works. I have, um, uh, link here for a video. So, because it's hard to explain what they look like. Let's see. Okay. All right. So, so this is a static air bronchogram, these hyperechoic uh, punctate type things here that don't really move. Lung is atelectatic, there's a pleural effusion here and diaphragm, uh, diaphragm is visible uh, and the deliver of the spleen. Okay, uh, dynamic air bronchograms. Very obvious difference here as the patient breathes, this hyperechoic uh, linear punctate areas that are coming up towards the periphery. Okay, so um, it's in communication with the air circuit, you might say, and then it uh, is basically like sputum, mucus, inflammation in the bronchi that are actually f moving uh, with, with, uh, with breathing. So um, those two things now, the dynamic air bronchograms increase the likelihood of um, pneumonia uh, or in some inflammatory kind of uh, um, consolidation. Static air bronchograms, are more likely to be fine atelectasis, but can also be seen in pneumonia as well. All right, so I have only one page on flight and plural effusions because they're very easy to recognize on ultrasound. Um, so these sort of these signs, the fine sign, jellyfish sign, should, I mean, is that's what, uh, that's how you identify a plural effusion. If you look here, this is the diaphragm and then you're not able to see the uh, thoracic aorta because the air uh, is, doesn't allow you to, you completely cannot image beyond the pleural line because air filled lung uh, is, is not, a, is not a, is basically a barrier to ultrasound wave. So when you see, when it's fluid in here, you can clearly see a thoracic, um, aor, uh, thoracic, uh, sorry, uh, vertebral bodies here, thoracic spine, and that's called the spine sign. Uh, in a real like a video, uh, the atelectatic lung is like a tentacle and it kind of moves in the pleural fluid. That's called a jellyfish sign. Um, if you uh, put M mode through a pleural effusion with respiratory cycle, it kind of it sort of moves the visceral part, the lung line, the visceral pleural kind of moves back and forth between the chest wall like this on M mode, and it's called the sinusoid sinusoid sign. It's supposed to be specific for a pleural effusion. Um, the pleural effusion, and then by the way, for comparison, this is a, an image of a, of a normal lung where you see thoracic, the ab abdominal, sorry, the, um, um, the, the spine here, but it kind of has an abrupt cutoff over here. And you see a mirror artifact, a mirror image artifact on this side of the diaphragm. Um, so this is actually normal. And the patient breathes in, you may even see like curtain sign where the lung comes into view. Um, so, um, so, uh, on that note, so 
you know, effusions can be uh, simple effusions uh, from heart failure or fluid overload, but they could also represent empyema or complicated parademonic effusions or from like autoimmune uh, disease that involves the pleura or, or, or like, uh, or cancer. So um, sometimes an ultrasound, you can, you can see that uh, because like in this case, this is called the planktonic sign where cellular debris is visible in the pleural space. Uh, plural, in the plural effusion, um, you can see like septations uh, and, 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 and like uh, fibrinous strands along the lung or on the pleura that would also represent like an inflammatory exudate in the setting of like uh, hemothorax, uh, hematocrit sign as in the red cells sort of settle in in a, in a space and they create like a hyperechoic uh, precipitant basically. And then uh, the, uh, the top part is like more anechoic. Uh, if you're looking at it um, from a different view, you'll see like, uh, you know, here's the rib, rib, uh, rib space, rib shadows. And then the pleural effusion is vi visible between the parietal and visceral pleura. And this is called the, uh, the quad sign. It's, um, uh, it's like sort of a, you know, a par uh, you can draw like a, uh, like a rectangle or a parallelogram here. Um, so these are some signs that um, help you help us define a plural effusion. Let me see. So how do we use this? So Dr. Lichtenstein has published like a blue protocol and a uh, blue protocol is like a way to um, quickly uh, under three minutes or so uh, identify the major causes of, of uh, respiratory distress in people, in patients that are critically ill. So um, you, the assumption here is there's like a four or five diagnoses that are very common and, um, and, uh, and they're more li and likely to cause the, be the reason for somebody's uh, dyspnea and shortness of breath. So um, just kind of to go through this, how it begins is you first look at the upper and lower blue points and you look for lung sliding. If lung sliding is present, okay, uh, uh, if lung sliding is present, you've ruled out a pneumothorax, okay? If lung sliding is absent, okay, then you have not identified pneumothorax yet. You have to look for a lung point. And if a lung point is present with abolished lung sliding, then you have a pneumothorax. If lung sliding is absent, okay, then um, then you need other other imaging modalities to diagnose a pneumothorax. Um, if you have um, if lung sliding is um, abolished, but you have B lines, okay, then uh, it could represent pneumonia. If you have um, A on one side, B on the other side, or consolidation, that too could be pneumonia. If you have bilateral B lines, it could be pulmonary edema. Um, if you have um, an A profile, which is basically A lines on both sides and lung sliding, and based on short of breath, you could look for a DVT to diagnose a pulmonary embolism. If a DVT study is absent, you could look, check the PLAPS point to look for pneumonia, see if you missed that on the upper and lower and lateral imaging. So uh, this is this basically is the table from his, uh, from his paper. And according to him in his, you know, look at the negative and positive predictive values here, it's a 90%. So the accuracy is about 90%, okay? And he was comparing it to CT as a gold standard. Okay, so quick way um, to help, uh, I mean, in real, I, I feel like in real life that people have multiple things going on at the same time, uh, but this is, uh, okay. I have a case here. So uh, this is where I end. So a uh, 20 year old man presents to the ED ambulance respiratory distress with oxygen saturation 86% on 15 liters with a non rebreather mask. He's unable to speak in full sentences. The paramedics reported that the patient had asthma. He experienced coughing, wheezing for the past week, which became worse today on physical exam. His BP is 130 over 78, pulse is 125, respiration is 30, temperature 37 degrees. Lung exam reveals decreased air movement throughout the diffuse wheezing. Uh, patients placed on oxygen, albuterol, hypertropion, IV steroids are started, point of care lung ultrasound exam is done. And a plural line right exhibits lung sliding left on the left side, it's identified. 
lung finding is not found, <clears throat> you put the probe laterally and you start M mode at this junction. Uh, and this is what you find. Any thoughts on what the diagnosis is? Okay, so this is like a lung point. Okay, so M mode through a lung point. Um, you see that in this in this area, the uh, M mode profile is switching from um, seashore and barcode sign. This is the chest wall. It stays the same. Okay, and then this is the uh, pleural line. And then you see here when the patient is in the patient breathes, uh, you see a sort of a seashore pattern. And then uh, when the air comes between that point, you see basically a barcode pattern. So this would be uh, suggestive of a pneumothorax. Those are my references and thank you very much. Great talk, Oxal. Thank you.